Well, thank you for the introduction. Hello and welcome to today's session. Today's session, as you all know, is on collaborative grammar activities. We will be looking at collaborative learning activities for middle school in particular for teaching grammar. And we're going to look at all of it in um, within the purview of a high impact strategy framework. So, um, we're hoping that by the end of the session, we will have a better understanding of effective grammar instruction, uh, particularly using collaborative grammar activities. We will also see how we can implement collaborative learning for grammar instruction um, using the blended approach for teaching and learning. All right, so before we start the session, if I can please have a show of hands to see how many of you are familiar with blended learning and collaborative learning practices. There's a little button at the end of your screen that you can press to raise your hand. All right, I see quite a few hands going up already. Um, all right, so, all right, more hands up, thank you. Um, all right, um, if you could please raise your hand again if you are teaching using blended learning approach. So if you're currently teaching using the blended learning approach, or if you are planning to use it again once the schools resume, um, or if you've taught online in the recent past, please raise your hand. Yeah, quite of us um, have been sort of, you know, pushed into this, um, um, into this new normal where we are all, you know, switching and juggling goals between um, teaching online and then learning new things and then teaching in the classroom as well. So yes, I see a lot of hands going up. Um, thank you for that feed up, uh, feedback. All right, so let's talk about, oops, sorry, let me just go back to my slide. All right, so let's talk about grammar instruction. What approaches and methodologies are you currently using for grammar instruction? We will be talking about some approaches today. We'll be mainly looking at collaborative learning, uh, but we will also see what other high impact strategies can be clubbed with collaborative learning. So what's the main approach that you're currently using in your school? Are you using a traditional approach to teaching grammar where you teach the rule and the students do a lot of practice exercises and learn grammar concepts that way? Or are you teaching an inverse method where you give students activities and they discover grammar rules on their own with your support, of course? Or are you using a more um, integrative approach to teaching grammar where you blend in grammar instruction with other kinds uh, with other skills such as reading listening speaking and writing all right um so a lot of you are using i can see in the comments and a lot of you let me just yes so i can see the comments coming in and a lot of you are using um um, the direct approach to teaching grammar where you're teaching rules and the students are practicing through grammar exercises. Now that's a nice and easy method of teaching grammar. And it's also important because we'll be, we'll be discussing when we discuss approaches to grammar, we'll see where it fits in very nicely. So that's good. I do see some responsive responses where you're integrating grammar rules as well. Um, um, there's a very interesting comment that just comes in that says that you integrate grammar concepts to an extent, but some approaches and some concepts can be difficult to integrate, uh, which is which is yes a very um, yeah that's that's quite true actually. Um, all right, so so that's a little bit about what kind of approaches you're using. So so I see a lot of mixed. Uh, and combination of approaches for teaching grammar, which is actually quite good because um, using a combination of approaches for particularly for different stages of learning works really well. Um, it is also important, very important to use explicit teaching for introducing concepts. Now explicit teaching is a high impact teaching strategy. Um, and there are lo loads and loads of studies that show that when a concept is introduced, um, it is retained better if the teacher explains it explicitly and then explicitly models it. Um, students also need worked examples to understand that concept better. Uh, so that means our resource should have all of that. It ha should have explicit explanation of grammar rules. 
so that it makes your life easier and it makes it easier for students to revise the concept. So picking and choosing books that have that is really important. Um, now, Grammar Tree is, is one of our books that has um, um, grammar rules explained, explained explicitly. And we're going to see how that comes very handy when students are working collaboratively or they need to go back and look at the rules. Um, once students understand the concepts, it's really important to provide extended practice using a variety of approaches and methods. So here's where your integration comes in, where you'd want to bring in games and other exciting teamwork um, to implement and to practice grammar concepts. Then using high impact strategies is really important across the board, whatever you're using, whatever you're teaching, um, choosing strategies that will yield the best results makes a lot of sense. So we will be incorporating high impact strategies into our instructional model today. Um, collaborative learning is one of the high impact strategies. It works really well across levels and we'll see how to implement it in grammar lessons. And then of course, formative assessment to guide, to guide instruction is really, really important, um, particularly um, in grammar. So collaborative learning, what is collaborative learning? Collaborative or cooperative learning as it is often called occurs when students work together in small groups and everyone participates in the learning task. So I really like this definition because it sets out um, the core principles for collaborative learning. So small groups, uh, so that working together is easier and then everybody participation, uh, everybody participating in the task is really important as well. So here are some top tips for making collaborative learning work. So if you want to implement collaborative learning in the classroom, uh, be it grammar lesson or any other lesson, we should regularly set up group tasks and establish ground rules uh, about how groups operate. Students really need to have a fairly good idea of how to work together in groups. Uh, they need to be explicitly taught uh, how to work as a team. So that means they need to understand their, role, uh, their roles and responsibilities within a team. They need to understand uh, what they're supposed to do individually and how can they contribute to the team. We should also be looking at designing tasks in a way that they make co uh, collaboration um, easy. So we should have tasks that require sharing expertise, uh, not, just, not just tasks that can be done individually as well, but where you actually need collaborative effort. Um, and when, when we discuss tasks, we'll see just how to do that. We should also differentiate learning according to student readiness levels. Um, and that's one way to make sure that everybody can contribute to the group task. Because if we have tasks that are beyond the student's reach, uh, they will not be able to effectively collaborate or contribute. Uh, we should also promote interactions uh, between students by um, using flexible grouping. So instead of just having one group and then following with that for a couple of classes or for a quarter or so, it is better to keep the grouping really flexible. So that means you need to evaluate and reevaluate and see where the students are standing and then put them together according to their readiness levels and interests. Some groupings can also be um, done considering um, the rules that the students are supposed to fulfill within the groups. All right, so let's look at collaborative learning tasks for grammar uh, and how does that link to high quality grammar instruction. So here are some collaborative learning activities that we will be looking at today. A lot of these are high impact strategies uh, and they can be implemented collaboratively. So we'll be looking at these in detail. Starting off with concept mapping. Now concept mapping is an excellent strategy for synthesizing information and making um, connections between um, ideas. So this activity or this strategy is a deep learning strategy. So that means we will implement it at a time when we have already introduced the concept. Um, now, this is a general observation that you know a lot of um, times, um, and there are research uh, studies to show this as well, that almost 90% of the times we, uh, when we are teaching in classrooms, we remain at the surface level. Now, the problem with that is that deep learning just doesn't occur. So for deep learning to happen, we have to uh, implement certain strategies. Uh, collaborative learning is one such strategy that helps students sort of, you know, uh, venture into deep learning. Concept mapping is another one uh, where they are supposed to synthesize information. 
uh, concept ma mapping generally lends itself really well to collaborative learning because uh, there's a lot of discussion and room for talk and collaboration to reinforce uh, concepts. So what you're doing in collaborative uh, concept mapping is you are working collaboratively um, um, to illustrate the connections that exist between terms and concepts. Um, and so let's let's just put together a concept map right now. So if you can type in your responses in the chat window, if you are familiar with the kinds of clauses, please um, share the kinds of clauses um, that we can put on this map. So if you'd be doing this in class, you would obviously do this activity once students uh, have done all various kinds of um, clauses. And they can, um, um, you know, you can assign them um, time to come up uh, and study different kinds of clauses, and then you can put them in groups. Once they start working in groups, so, so let's say you assign them a topic and then you give them some time, um, you can either have one group and then, you know, assign different kinds of clauses. Um, so let's see your answers coming in. Yes, there's the noun clause and adverb, yes. And yes, adjective clauses. So let's see the concept now. So you can have something like this. Students can be working on, you can either give them certain kinds of clauses to study, or they can all study different kinds of clauses and then come prepared for group work where they will be making this concept map. So you can assign them um, different groups and they can work on um, putting together a concept map. This of course, you know, depending on how you structure clauses and dependent and depend, uh, dependent clauses as well. And then you can have students um, come up with examples. Um, and so now your, your book, The Grammar Tree has, um, uh, has good explanations on all of these. It has consolidated uh, information on all of these concepts. So there, there's individual practice and then there's consolidation as well. So students can very easily just go to these pages and um, relearn these concepts. And when they come to class, they are uh, ready to draw concepts maps and understand the connections um, between these related concepts. This can also be integrated really well in reciprocal um, teaching. Now, reciprocal teaching is another high impact strategy. It's a collaborative learning strategy. Um, it's mainly used in the reading classroom. So have you used reciprocal teaching in your classes before or not? You can type in yes or no. Okay. So some of you haven't really used, but are familiar with it. And then I see some responses from people who are using it in the reading classroom. Yes, yeah, so reciprocal teaching works really well in the reading classroom um, and in reading lessons. And it's generally used over there and it's sort of drawn from there. So reciprocal teaching um, um, is where students take the role of the teacher in question generation and clarifying concepts. Um, and this is once the teacher has explained the concept, modeled it, and then modeled the behaviors as well. So if the students are supposed to ask questions, you've already modeled how to do that. Or if the students are supposed to take the role in clarifying concepts, you've already modeled, you've already shared some sentence structured structures with them, you've already showed them how to do it. So this is more about show, don't tell. Uh, don't tell them what they're supposed to do, show them what exactly they're supposed to do in the groups. Once they understand that, you break them off into groups. And if you're in the classroom and the students are back in the classrooms, you can very easily break them off into small groups uh, while maintaining social uh, distancing. And if they are in the classroom, um, sorry, in the digital um, classroom, if they are joining in online, then you can uh, put them into break, uh, breakout groups breakout rooms where they can collaborate uh, and work in teams. Um, so this strategy can be implemented once students have a strong content knowledge. So this is again a deep learning uh, activity. So surface level exercise is already done. So that means you've explicitly taught the concept and you've modeled it. Um, and so um, you can also do a little bit of shared practice before reciprocal teaching. Um, and then you can provide structured scaffolds to guide students' um, discussion and learning. Now, what are structural scaffolds? So we've got some over here. Question stems, 
uh, are a kind of structural scaffold that helps students think about what kind of questions they're going to ask. Um, you can also give them exemplars. Um, so, you know, example questions or example um, clarification, uh, discussion points, discussion stems can be really good. So let's take this example, how dash is different from dash. So, you know, they can use this simple question stem to come up with their own questions what, for whatever topic you've given them. Uh, for instance, if they are looking at clauses, uh, and then they can discuss how noun, clause, noun clauses are different from adjective clauses, right? So they can just simply pick up this question stem and come up with their own questions. If, for instance, they're stuck and they don't know um, how to come up with questions, you can give them um, you can give them some example questions, um, such as how can we use models in reported speech, right? Or how do we use auxiliary verbs? So you can use question stems such as this one over here, how dash is different from dash. So they can use this question stem to generate their questions for any topic that you've given them. Um, so for instance, if they are um, discussing differences between um, now clauses and uh, let's say phrases, they can make up a question using this question stem such as how are clauses different from phrases? Or you can give them example questions such as, um, uh, where do we use auxiliary model verbs? Uh, now that's a question that they can find an answer to and that's, that requires them to dig deeper. They can find the answers from the book, from the notes in their lectures, or they can do research online and then um, collaboratively find answers to these questions. Now, another really good collaborative uh, activity is the jigsaw activity and you can adapt it for your grammar lesson. Uh, again, something that's used in the reading lesson, but in the grammar lesson, it can be, um, it can be used just as well. So here's this quote from Elliot um, Aronson, uh, who, uh, who, who did a lot of work in developing this technique. So he says in the collaborative classroom, the students achieve success as a consequence of paying attention to their pairs, asking good questions, helping each other, teaching each other, and helping each other teach. So these are um, the main um, behaviors that we'd want to see in a jigsaw grammar activity as well, or generally in a jigsaw activity. So here's how jigsaw groups will work. Um, there are three steps to this. So step one, we're going to assign a topic um, to a home group or an expert group, for example, and then again, jigsaw group uh, will, you know, you'll be making jigsaw groups when students have um, covered um, the essentials um, and they've, um, you'll be looking at broader concepts to cover. So you can pick a concept such as uh, phrases, right? And then you can assign different phrases to different groups. So you can make an expert group on noun phrases and then another one on adjective phrases and then one on adverb phrases. Um, students will be given time to research on uh, their topics and then they will be meeting to discuss and further understand the topic. They could at this point bring in um, um, extended uh, exercises to solve. You could provide them exercises to solve um, and they could develop their expertise on this particular topic that they've been given. Now, by this time, they have done all of these in class. They've done noun phrases, adjectival phrases, and adverb phrases. Um, so it's a kind of revision and deep learning exercise. Step two, and this could be done at home, so you don't actually have to do it in school. Um, so you, you know, you, so the issue of time can be resolved very nicely by just sort of assigning them this individual work because they've already done this with you in the class. Step two is where you take students, you pull out students from the expert groups and you put them um, together, one student or two students from each expert group into a new jigsaw group. So the jigsaw groups will work together um, and each student in the jigsaw group will contribute information about their topic. So maybe you can give them an exercise or um, a slightly higher level exercise where students are supposed to um, distinguish um, between noun phrases, adjective phrases, and adverb phrases, and come up with reasons um, to explain their answer. 
So they can do this in um, together because this requires a sharing of expertise. And then step three is where students can return to their expert groups and share their newly acquired knowledge with the expert group. Um, so you can give them key learning slips uh, where students fill in those slips and take back their key learning to the expert group. So what is something new that they've learned? So the key learning slips can look something like this, and this can be very easily done online as well, as well as in the classroom. If you're doing this online, the expert groups and the jigsaw groups can meet um, online in um, breakout rooms, and um, they can document their responses on Google Documents. You can even put it up for sharing for all, and they can review each other's comments and comment on each, other, each other's work. So that's how they learn from each other. Um, now, this is another cooperative learning strategy that I really like because it is so flexible. It lets you think independently, then come together in teams, then work again independently, and then work um, in, in bigger, slightly bigger groups. Uh, so you're moving from independent thinking to collaborative effort. It is a structured activity for collaborative and independent practice. And... Um, it works really well in grammar lessons. So what you do is you set apart two minutes for independent work. Whatever concept the students are learning, they will be practicing it uh, independently for two minutes. So they're going to look at what they'll be doing, the, the exercise uh, or the grammar task. Then four minutes, they discuss the task with somebody in pairs. Um, so the person sitting next to them, or they can walk across the room and find someone to discuss it in pairs or they could just link up with, if they're at home and if you're doing online um, teaching, they could just reach out to someone on WhatsApp or call someone and discuss the activity in pairs. Once they've done that, they have a better understanding of the task, um, they have time to then um, work on the task independently. Now, if you are teaching online, this can very well be done before the class where you assign them work, um, at the end of the class, they can discuss it in pairs um, before the next class and then start working on the task independently. Um, and if you're doing it in class, then just two minutes for independent work, four minutes for discussion, six minutes for independently working on it again, and then um, eight minutes in the end to discuss their answers within a group, explaining their reasons for each of the answers that they've given. So. So we've already slightly discussed how we can adapt this activity to use in our online classroom. But if you have any bright ideas on how we can use this in the classroom, please feel free to share them. I will be reading your responses in the chat window and you can type in while we are talking. Okay, so, so I really like this idea that uh, the last bit uh, can be done um, in small groups before class as well. So, so that sharing bit can be done uh, while other students are working on, um, on their exercises. You can uh, put students into breakout rooms um, and you, know, you can be part of that discussion as well so that you can monitor what's going on. Or it can also be done on a shared document. It can be done through a back channeling device while you're explaining concepts and you're having class discussions. School, students can be contributing to uh, the overall class discussion. All right, so collaborative spaced grammar practice is another collaborative grammar activity that works really well. It's a high impact strategy. What you're doing is you use different activities um, and vary them and paste, uh, space them over um, time. So instead of one big grammar lesson, you dice it up into smaller, um, shorter sessions. Uh, you focus both on content and skills, um, and, um, and you'll be spacing the grammar lesson over several days. So it could be spaced over a week or two. What you're doing is instead of, let's say one whole class or two whole classes of a grammar lesson, you split it in explaining the lesson or explaining the concept in a mini lesson, and then students can move on and do something else. And then um, over a couple of days, you can then keep practicing that concept in 10, 15 short um, um, practice bursts. So the idea is that deep learning develops over time over multiple spaced interactions with new knowledge and concepts. And that's, a, that's something that 
um, that has come through in a lot of research um, studies that learning is deeper and more lasting if you if you if students are exposed to the concept um, through multiple spaced um, you know uh, spaced activities um, and this can be also you know you can also integrate different skills while you are practicing these grammar activities um, spacing them over time so you could link them up with um, with other activities, um, you know, such as listening, speaking, reading, and writing. So here's an example of how you can do it. So this is an integrative grammar practice lesson, which is linked up to writing. So let's say you have a narrative writing uh, or a story writing lesson, um, and you want to integrate some part of grammar with it, and you want to practice, you know, you want to implement this um, concept of space grammar practice. So if you can do a short five minute review mini lesson on um, changing um, um, direct speech to reported speech, you can then give students an assignment in collaborative groups where they can use, you know, um, like these um, uh, visuals uh, and speech bubbles into um, reported speech and write a story on it. So you could start with a story starter, like it was a typical English lesson. The teacher, Mr. Ahmed, put up uh, a poster for the class to copy. And then you can start um, by the story by changing the speech bubbles into reported speech. So let's, let's do that right now. Can you pick any one speech bubble? You decide which one you want to pick and how you want to st um, start your story. Can you pick one and um, and and um, start making up a story by changing that speech bubble into reported speech. You can use um, um, you can use descriptive words to make your story more interesting. Okay, so you can type in your responses. Oh, I really like this one. Yeah, this one response that has just popped up. So the little boy sitting in the uh, corner, sorry, yeah. So the little boy sitting in the corner, it's about um, how the boy um, is distracted and asks the class, uh, asks uh, his friend um, if she could lend him her pen. So, so great work over there, you have um, changed um, the pronouns over there and you've followed all rules, but you've also added descriptions to make your story interesting. Um, now that's something that you can, you know, sort of implement in the classroom, you can model it. You can just, just like, you know, uh, we did right now, you can change one speech bubble and then you can show students how it's done. Each student can pick a different speech bubble to start their story with. And so you will have different stories coming in from each group. Um, so, you know, you can have students working in groups changing uh, speech bubbles together. One of the students could probably add um, descriptive words. One could you know, look at making uh, the story more rich in descriptions. Um, so you can have different roles and students can be working together to creating story, uh, um, on, can be working together to create stories that are interesting to, to read, um, that have all the, um, you know, um, essentials of a good story writing, but where they're also practicing grammar. Likewise, um, they could just take any story. So you have stories and comprehension exercises in the grammar tree where they can take those stories and they can take the, um, change them into either graphic novels, uh, which is something that, you know, grade eight students would really enjoy, or they can make comics out of it. So they can pick and choose parts of the story and make comic, comics out of it. Another excellent cooperative learning strategy is Think Pair Share. It is really useful because students can develop their confidence, they can share ideas in pairs and then uh, share them with a wider audience. So this is how Think Pair Share would work um, in a classroom. So you can link it up with any activity, any grammar concept, and it works really well for brainstorming and class discussions. So what you do is you introduce a concept such as, you know, if I am talking about uh, reported speech, or if I'm talking about, let's say complex nouns, 
uh, any grammar concept that you'd want to introduce. And if you have a question that you want to ask the students, if you want to engage them in a discussion, uh, before you ask that, when once you ask that question, before you, they're expected to answer, you give students time to think. So you can do this in an online classroom as well. You can set up timers uh, to make it interesting and to keep record of time. And you can give them, you know, really short time just to think about the answer before they can respond. So it is anywhere, the thinking time is anywhere from 30 seconds to one minute. And you can do this before class, you can do it during class. If you're teaching online, then you can even um, share content or your video lessons with the students and ask them to think about it before they come to the class. So that thinking time is inbuilt. Um, one, once they've done that, they will discuss their idea with, uh, with, with either their neighbor if they're in the classroom or they can reach out to another student and discuss their idea with them or WhatsApp or any other interactive tool really. So what they're doing is they are reaffirming their ideas. They're developing consensus. They're learning to agree or disagree about things. Um, and you know sometimes students don't have ideas. Sometimes some students will be struggling with a concept. So by discussion, they can also get ideas. So you know, let's say they really like the idea that somebody in the you know the, their partner shared. So they can then, you know, instead of just taking that idea without giving credit, they can then agree and say, well, you know, I really agree with my partner on this. And I think this answer makes sense or they can disagree. Um, so that gives them ideas to talk about. And once they are prepared, then they can share their idea with the whole class. So you can do this uh, before class or if you're doing online classes, then you can have um, breakout rooms where students can share their ideas. Um, this is actually done in either big groups so that you can have two teams or this can be done really well, um, um, you know, by writing and sharing ideas. So you can have a Google document to record class discussions where students can share their ideas. All of them can type in at the same time and in real time contribute ideas. Um, or you could have, uh, for, for Google presentation, uh, for that matter, has this really good feature where you can post questions while uh, the presentation is going on. So the students can use that feature to type in their responses. They could use a polling software. So you can put in a poll and um, say agree, disagree, or you know put in options and they can um, choose the option that they agree with. You can use whiteboards, interactive whiteboards online uh, where students can add in their ideas. Or you could set up our time before class for this. Um, and all of these strategies work really well, you know, collaborative learning and independent learning, but um, it works really well in a blended model. So if you are working on a blended model, you can use any of these strategies um, um, in the collaborative activities um, um, section or in, you know, where you're setting up stations, particularly um, ones where students are working together and you know you might have another group of students that might need instruction. Um, so remember we spoke about um, breaking up the grammar lesson and spaced interaction. So this is a good opportunity for you to lead a small group in teacher-led instruction. So you could be giving many lessons to one group, whereas the rest of the class, uh, a part of them could be working on collaborative learning uh, activities. Uh, in their group learning stations. Another chunk um, could be divided up and engaged in online instruction. So you could give them a video to watch uh, and reflect on. Uh, think their share would work really well where they watch something and they're um, thinking about it and then pairing up with another person to, sh uh, to sort of you know discuss their ideas. Um, and then you can switch. Uh, so um, the online instruction group can then come to the teacher-led instruction group. The teacher-led instruction group could then move on to collaborative activities and stations. And the collaborative learning activity station, um, you know, those who are done with it could then move on to online instruction. So these are all, these stations are rotating. Um, and in online instruction, this can be done in the classroom or it can also be done very easily online. So instead of having one big class with a lot of students online, you can break up the class into teacher-led instruction, collaborative activity station, and online instruction. Um, and you can very easily flip these so that each small group will get your individual attention. 
uh, teacher-led instruction sessions are really good for explicit instruction. And once, once the students are ready, they can then be moved on to collaborative learning activities. Here are some points to remember when you're planning your collaborative activities. One, guided practice is really important. Once students have learned the concept and you have um, directly taught that concept, um, it is very important to provide guided practice. You can provide that guided practice in teacher-led sessions or um, students, the more able students who have learned that concept better can be doing that in collaborative groups. Um, it is important to integrate mini grammar lessons. Uh, so, you know, you can do it through spaced collaborative practice or you can do it through online um, um, uh, rotate, rotating stations. Uh, so it can be done in that way. Differentiated activities are really important and they can be so easy to incorporate in online learning. You could have different groups working on different activities. Uh, what is really important is a strong focus on content. Throughout secondary, we are really looking at developing a depth of knowledge um, because of just merely focusing on skills will not work. Students have to have a strong content knowledge so that they're ready for high school. You also should be making use of flexible grouping uh, so that students are interacting with a wide, wide range of, um, um, you know, with a wider um, group of students. And you need to integrate core learning areas co-learning areas with language skills, such as, you know, grammar over here needs to be integrated with different skills. And we just briefly discussed how we can do that. Um, so assessments are really important as well. And collaborative learning activities can be used particularly well for formative assessments. Now you have checkpoints and monthly assessments or end of quarter assessments given in um, the grammar tree. There are lots of tests in other books as well that you can use. Um, it is it is really a good idea to team up students for uh, um, for collaborative work on some of these assessments as well, uh, because it's it becomes a really good opportunity for students to revise the concepts, right, and um, and show you how how well they know that concept within the groups. And if you clearly define the roles of uh, every student and if you can monitor their um, you know that they're working collaboratively you you wouldn't even have to worry about you know some students working and the others not contributing uh, to the assessment um, there are some really good online tools that you can use for collaborative uh, assessments formative assessments online or even individual assessments online there's Kahoot, there's quizlet you can use google forms uh, all of these are really good tools and they have their own individual strengths. Kahoot, for instance, is really good for um, team exercises. So you can um, make team quizzes and you can um, you know, divide the class into four groups or two teams, uh, and then you can give them team challenges. It lets, you, uh, it lets the students play the game in real time. So you can do it in an online classroom and it immediately shows you the results. So that excitement of you know, who wins and which team is doing better um, is there. So you can use that in the classroom. All right, to just quickly review what we've discussed today, we used, uh, discussed how to use a mix of explicit instruction and guided practice for teaching grammar. We discussed how we can use collaborative learning and other high impact strategies for grammar instruction at the secondary school level. We used, um, um, we, we discussed how we can use collaborative learning activities during different stages of the lesson, uh, particularly for guided practice and how we can club it with direct instruction. We also discussed how we can use collaborative learning activities with, HUD, with other high impact strategies to make learning even more meaningful and impactful. So that was it for today's session. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please type in your questions and comments in the chat box and I will be here to answer your questions. Thank you. So I'll be taking your questions now. Please type in your questions and comments. 